When Hamilton told me we were going to have the folks from GeekWire as our program today about two months ago, I was so excited. This is going to be an outstanding program because GeekWire is an, ind uh, is an independent technology news site and online community. It's based here in Seattle and it covers the peoples, the companies, the innovations, and the emerging technology in the Pacific Northwest and how it impacts our world. Our, speaker, our lead speaker today is Todd Bishop, who co-founded the site in March of 2011 with John Cook in partnership with a startup veteran and investor, Jonathan Sassato. Close enough. As, a veteran, as veteran technology journalists with two decades of combined experience covering the tech big, John and Todd have embraced the digital revolution and the new online tools while attempting to try and stay true to the ethics of true reporting digging through documents, talking to the sources directly, getting into the community, and seeking out ways to put news into the day into a larger context and a, a whole new perspective. So won't you rec recognize a warm Seattle for um, welcome to our whole panel from GeekWire. Thank you, Tom. Yep, thanks. All right, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I was listening to uh, Eric's invocation, and it's amazing the, the things that have happened already, and we actually have some representations of the things on, on this panel that are yet to come. So I'd, I'd like to, to introduce our panel. First, um, closest to me is Jeremy Jake. He is a founder of both Aldus and Visio. You've probably used software that his company's produced. He's an industry veteran who is now CEO of the Snoopy Wireless Technology start Startup, that's S-N-U-P-I. It's a University of Washington spin-out whose Wally sensors detect water, humidity, and temperature changes in the home. Uh, next to Jeremy is Julie Sandler. She is a principal at Madrona Venture Group. She's involved in a variety of the firm's portfolio companies. She leads Madrona's investment in e-commerce startup uh, Julep, and she also serves as a board observer for a variety of startups, including Snoopy. Uh, she launched the Seattle Entrepreneurial Women's Network, but her biggest claim to fame, I have to say, is that she is GeekWire's current reigning Geek of the Year in recognition of her contributions to the community, and you're never going to live that down, Julie. <laughs> Uh, Sarah, uh, next to Julie is Michael Schutzler. He is the CEO of D the WTIA, the Washington Technology Industry Association, which is really a vital organization for the technology industry here in the Seattle region and Washington state. Uh, he's a startup investor and board member of many startups, and he's a part-time professor at the University of Washington. He's also the former CEO of the language learning company Live Mocha. And finally, Sarah Bird is the CEO of Moz, the Seattle startup whose software uh, helps companies manage and improve their search engine optimization, social media, brand, and content marketing. She's a graduate of the University of Washington School of Law, and she's also cementing Mazza's position as one of the leading startups in the Seattle region. I have to say that after listening to uh, the whole audience, but in particular Sarah, sing America the Beautiful, I think she might have missed her calling as a singer. Let's start a tradition at our GeekWire events where we sing America the Beautiful and have Sarah come up. It was fantastic. <laughs> Um, so, hearkening back to the, the invocation, things are moving so rapidly in the technology industry broadly around the world, but also here in the Seattle region. It's no longer just Microsoft, it's no longer just Amazon. There is a wide breadth of startups here in this community, which is one of the reasons why it's so fascinating to cover it uh, as a journalist. And one example is actually Snoopy Technologies. This is a company that was spun out of the University of Washington. Jeremy is the CEO. It's based in part on uh, research by a gentleman by the name of Shwetak Patel, who is a MacArthur genius, who developed all sorts of fancy things to do uh, in the home. And so what Snoopy does right now with their Wally home sensors is they actually leverage the electrical wiring in your home as an antenna to propagate the signals that these sensors pick up. And then they're able to tell you, for example, if uh, your, your um, hot water heater is leaking or if there's too much humidity in the house. And you know, Jeremy has a really interesting perspective. So I'd like to start with you, Jeremy, if I could. Uh, back from the days of you know, leading Visio and now leading Snoopy, can you share your perspective on how things have changed for someone leading a company in this region and how they're better, how they're worse, and what it's like now in 2014 compared to a decade ago. Well, a lot of us are older, for starters. Uh, you know, back when, uh, when I started, um, co-founded uh, Aldis, I was in my 20s, 
and I was in my early 40s when I started at, at Vizio, and I'm getting kind of old now. So uh, there's definitely been an aging of the industry as a whole, and with that I think comes um, a lot of changes, mostly around. Um, uh, I don't, I don't, well, let's just say industries mature and you see more uh, specialization, you see more, you see less um, um, of the kind of wild bets, you see more, more I think, uh, thoughtful bets than, than you do in the early stages of an industry because in the early stages people don't necessarily know what's going to work and the competition is very weak or non-existent. As an industry matures, it, it gets more competitive and I think people have to kind of specialize a little bit more to find the niche that's going to stand out from everything else. So I would say that's the big, the big change. Is, is it harder or easier now to launch a successful startup in the Seattle region, a technology startup? I would probably say harder, but then again, if you ask somebody who's younger, they might say easier. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is great. So Sarah is leading Moz. So let's hear from your perspective. Sarah. Yeah, I, I think it's easier than ever before to start a technology company. I think the infrastructure now, um, with our access to the cloud and Amazon, our own backyard, and the work they're doing at Microsoft. I mean, you can get access to big technology so cheaply so easily over the internet the moment you need it. And uh, talent is always a, always a challenge. Um, and that is certainly my biggest challenge that you'll probably get tired of hearing me speak about. It's a good thing this is only half an hour long. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's easier than ever before to reach people all over the world. So I, I can form relationships with people in countries everywhere who can help contribute to my business. And I, that means we're working all the time. We're working more productively. We get you know, really, really... Um, you know, easy access to capital, capital in a lot of ways. I think in the seed stage in Seattle now, with more accelerators than ever before. Techstars, Founders Co-op, Microsoft has an accelerator. Um, the SVB, uh, SVP pitch, social ventures pitch contest. I mean, there's a lot of access, I think, to, for early companies. I totally agree with you about the bets seem smaller, right? A lot of things seem like they're features and not really big ideas or sustainable companies, but that's not necessarily bad, right? Yeah, it's different. I, it's but different. I also point out that what you're doing is is software yes. and it's a big difference if you're just doing software then having all this computing power available to you easily is, is a big win and if your business depends on reaching broadly and just making a digital connection with somebody that's much easier than it used to be that's not true of all businesses though I think from my perspective the answer to your question about what's different is this exactly six years ago how many of them were there zero how many of them are there now? A billion. And there are more of these things shipping than there are computers shipping. And to, the, to your point, the reason why it's so much easier to do an application now is because it really it literally takes one, one person with a modest programming skill to be able to create an application and have a ready to go marketplace to test it on. It is completely different than it was even just five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. A lot harder to be discovered though. <laughs> Jeremy said it's a lot harder to be discovered, though. Yeah, go ahead, Julie. What about your perspective? You know, I, I'd say what's also changed is Seattle is on the map. Uh, there's a lot of things that make us uh, very distinct now. In fact, one thing that rises to the top, I was having a conversation the other day about what makes Seattle culture distinct and how has that changed over the years. And, you know, I've worked uh, in the tech community in the Bay Area and also in Seattle. And one thing that I hear a lot from friends and former colleagues in the Bay Area is that the Seattle tech community just seems so nice. And, and that bugs me a little bit. I mean, to, to a degree, I think one thing that makes our tech community really unique is the fact that it is very collaborative. There is this ethos around the rising tide lifts all startups. And it's not uncommon to see two founders who are in the same sector you know, meeting regularly and supporting each other and using each other as sounding boards. It's not uncommon to go down to uh, a Starbucks in downtown Seattle and see a renowned tech executive meeting with a 22-year-old out of UW with an idea. Um, there's very much that collaborative ethos. But that also belies the fact that entrepreneurs in Seattle are aggressive. There is healthy competition here. You know, um, Entrepreneurs like uh, the ones on the stage today, they go after what they know is right for their company. Uh, it's exciting to see. It's inspiring to see as an investor. And I think that tension between the collaboration and that aggression is what's contributed to so many of the successes that have come out of Seattle very recently and have really put the city on the map. 
But to uh, the point of Sarah and, and to some extent Michael, it seems like, and, and to Jeremy, that there, there are somewhat smaller bets being taken here. I think a lot of times people want Seattle startups to really swing for the fences and, and to try and you know, hit grand slams, and it seems like they're hitting more singles. Uh, is, is there a, a question of ambition? Are startups here being big and bold and, and, and bright enough in terms of what they're trying to accomplish? And what, what impact Did does that have on the region? Did you say bright enough? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> well, you're not smarter in San Francisco. No, absolutely. That's that's a good point. Take no, me to task I, on I, that. I, I think we're just 10 to 20 years behind the power curve. The difference between the San Francisco arena and our arena is that our entire industry was a rounding error 25 years ago. It was Microsoft and a, and a handful of other smaller startup, startup software companies, and that was it. And now it's 25 years later, and we have a viable... Uh, not only startup ecosystem, but we actually have what I would consider to be a growing and viable venture capital marketplace. I mean, it went through a really difficult shakeout period, don't you think? And I think that from my standpoint, the reason that the bets have been smaller to date is because we're just earlier in the game. It doesn't mean we're not swinging for the fences. I can assure you that my, I have swung for the fences. I suspect you've swung for the fences too. And plenty of us <laughs> have been swinging for the fences. It's just... It's, if you're going to use the baseball metaphor, we just haven't had as many at-bats yet. You give us enough at-bats, you'll, you'll see as many home runs here as you did in San Francisco. I, I want to add just a little color, because I don't think I disagree, but I, I, I want to add a layer that I, because we are younger, right, we don't have as many third-generation founders, and I think they tend to be bolder and think bigger because they have a longer time span in their thinking, right? They, they see the world and all of its complexity and think bigger. And I think that when you have a young, younger entrepreneurs, first-time entrepreneurs, second-time entrepreneurs, they have a smaller time span, and they're looking at what's impacting me right now and my generation or my family right now. And so I think that, I think that it's true that it's changing because we have had some great IPOs, for example, and I want to see that, tr I hope to be part of that trend, right? But I, I think that we can expect that some of the bets will be, we'll consider sort of small bets until we're on th more third, fourth generation entrepreneurs that have more big wins. Because it, it's, it's an ecosystem, right? And it's, they, we've got to give back and we've got to you know, keep thinking big and it, it grows. It doesn't, you don't start out that way. You don't graduate from UW thinking that way necessarily. Let's get really tangible here for a second because I know uh, there's obviously lots of folks who are really engaged with the business community in this audience, but not necessarily uh, deep into technology. So for each of you, uh, apart from your own, uh, what's the most promising or interesting Seattle area startup uh, that members of the audience probably haven't heard about? Uh, just to put you on the spot with a little bit of a lightning round here. Uh, Michael, you're nodding as if you have one directly in mind. <laughs> Sure. Uh, so, so uh, aside of from the 60 companies in our portfolio, yes. I choose one that it's not in our portfolio. You may get a we, pass on that. <laughs> <required to it. laughs> well, you know, there's there's um, there's one uh, that came out of TechStars, which is a, a local accelerator program here in Seattle uh, called Skill Jar, led by uh, an entrepreneur by the name of Sandy Lin out of Amazon, and, and they've created a platform upon which large companies uh, and online instructors, in fact, can. Uh, film, post, and deliver classes online, which is something that a lot of companies and instructors have struggled with. I think it's a really smart idea, a really compelling team. I think online education is uh, obviously a very fascinating sector right now, and it's, it's a startup that I've uh, got my eye on. I like it. Nice. Okay, yeah. good. Go ahead, Michael. There's a startup in Seattle in the biotech sector called Accucella. Uh, it's about a 12-year-old molecule that's uh, working on something called visual cycle modulation. You take a pill, and this particular molecule only attaches to the part of the eye that degenerates under macular degeneration, which includes glaucoma. And if it doesn't attach to that, it passes out through urine. Twelve years later, they are now nearing the very end of phase two. Nobody knows about this company, and yet they went public in Japan, raised $170 million because you need that much money just to get to the next stage. So they're still a, a solid two, three years away from finishing their work before they can even hope to have a drug in the marketplace. But that's an, it's just a, to me, that's a sort of a poster child of a quiet story that started out in a lab in UW by a really smart doctor who 12 years later is still swinging for the fences, still spending tens of millions of dollars, and still hoping to make something really big and wonderful happen. Yeah. 
How about you, sir? Yeah, I want to cheat and give two. I know it's supposed to be one, so I'll be quick. Um, one is very, very early. I was doing some mentoring for um, the next accelerator, um, and they there was a company that went through that, I, I believe called Canary. I think they settled on just their name is Canary. And they make sensors that detect air quality that you can just wear around, and it can actually then, um, you, you, know, you can see on your phone how's the air quality today. And this is going to really help everyone who's suffering from asthma, it, it just to monitor how safe is it for me to go out, and for parents even to keep track for their loved ones. What do I need to do to be ready? Um, so it's stuff like that. It's that interaction of sort of hardware and more wired up world that I'm really excited about. And it also has a global health thing that I'm like really into. And they're making them super cheap, right? This, they're just, it's cheap, cheap, cheap technology. So it can be ubiquitous. Um, and then another one that's been around longer, but I, you guys are all probably really busy like me. I use Glimpse a lot. Glimpse is a local Seattle startup. You've heard of it. Some of you have heard of it. And yeah, and it's great for like pick up, drop off. I'm going to be here. How far away from you? I'm going to be at this corner or not and you can just go to your phone and send and it's it's time sensitive you can say I only want this person to see my location for 20 minutes right maybe it's a business colleague you're running late I'm here and I can just watch your progress so for me where I'm always connecting I find that to be really helpful so I'll, I'll cheat just a little bit this isn't really a company and um, I do have some connection to it I'll be very weak which is my um, co-founder dr. Patel uh, has developed this technology um, for the, it's the first smartphone application requiring FDA approval. Uh, it basically does the same measurements as a spirometer does for lung function, but he, but he measures lung function by the noise that you make when you breathe at your phone. Uh, this is kind of cool stuff, and it's, it's the sort of thing that I think you're going to see more and more of where, where a lot of applications that have used specialized equipment over the years are going to start moving to things you have with you. Another lightning round question here for you, and this is very fast. If, if you had $100 to invest today, would you put it into Amazon or into Microsoft? <laughs> okay, okay, I'm, I'll go. I'd put it in Microsoft. I actually thought, thought about this a bit, and uh, uh, Microsoft is, is in a really good position with regard to enterprise software and corporate in-house developers. And I think that's a very difficult position for them to be dislodged from over time. So I, I think they're going to have a nice steady run for a long time. Uh, of course, I think Amazon is a great company too. It's a very tough question. Yeah, yeah we've got the investor here, so let's hear it, Julie. Well, I got to be loyal to my former employer. That's I am right. I am long on Amazon, and I think a couple of drivers of that would be uh, the Amazon Web Services business, which is uh, you know, seeing an explosive growth year over year. That will in my opinion, continue. Also, what they're doing with digital products is extremely compelling with tablets and phones and television. They're collecting so much data about you. They're going to know your fears, your wishes, your hopes, and they're going to make you buy things you didn't know you need. So I'm, I'm, I'm very long on Amazon. Yeah, I should have said, uh, Julie, in her past life, worked on the Kindle business at Amazon. So. All right, so I get fired from the University of Washington if I don't answer this correctly. Uh, <laughs> Because I teach finance. So the correct answer is you're giving me $100, right? And it's not That's a $100 right. bill? All right, That's I'm right. going to put $50 in Microsoft and $50 in Amazon. You know, there's always somebody, you know? Um, I'm Amazon uh, because I, that already, I mean, that already happens. If you look at my, both my business, what we spend at Moz, where, who we're giving money to, and then personally, who I give money to, it's Amazon all the way, and it's growing. My, their, their share of my wallet it's growing. It's embarrassing, guys. So, like, I'm, I believe in it. I, I, Amazon all the way. Okay, we've got some Amazon bulls on the panel. On that topic, does anybody know how many employees Amazon currently has? I'd be really curious to know if anybody could come within 5,000. Okay, you've got some really smart people in this audience. <laughs> so, actually, it's, it is more than that now. There are upwards of 130,000 employees. Uh, that is essentially tripled in size over a very small period of time. And that is, Amazon does not actually disclose it, um, the, the, you know, and actually their workforce is a bit difficult to do apples to apples comparisons with because they have a lot of distribution center workers, so it's not quite that. But you look at this hyper growth by Amazon and, and you cannot help but ask yourself, is there a bubble happening here, not only with Amazon, but perhaps in the broader tech sector? And this is actually a really important question. It, is there a bubble? I mean. 
people are pouring, investors are pouring money into food delivery services. That is the hot sector right now. And I don't know if you, any of you remember back in the dot-com bubble, there was a service called My Lackey, and that was kind of the sign, okay, things are coming to an end. And now you've got tons of food delivery services that are raising huge VC rounds. So I want to ask the panel, is there a, is there a bubble in the technology economy right now that's at risk of popping? I see we're getting close to time. I'm going to be short. Um, there is not a bubble. I think the fundamentals are really strong. I don't think we're repeating the same mistakes. I do think that valuations are more aggressive right now, and that's always going to cycle, right? We're all, and I think we're in a slightly more aggressive phase, but I'm not worried about it. When you say bubble, I'm thinking 2000 bubble, and I don't think we're anywhere near that. It's fundamentals are there. I really want to hear Michael's answer to this. Uh, we are definitely not in a bubble. We are in a bull market. There's a big difference. It's not going to pop. It's growing. And it will decline again, but it's not popping. Well, I, I would agree. I, I think the, the bubble maybe occurs on the investment side where you see valuations go up and down. But in terms of the, the fundamental business, it's good. Yeah. Very good. I really want to get your take on this too, Julie, if you don't mind. I think things are very frothy. Very frothy. Okay, very, define that because that, that phrase is thrown around a lot. What, yeah. what do you mean in, by that? In terms of uh, valuations that you see everywhere, uh, including Seattle, but especially the Valley. Um, some of them strike me as, as hard, to, hard to back up in the ways we classically would like to back them up. Um, the amount of check writing that you're seeing is certainly at a startling velocity right now. Uh, I would, however, like to come to the defense of food delivery startups, because <laughs> I saw a lot of head shaking there. <laughs> And you know, I think what's interesting is uh, in, in times like this, you do see a lot of capital being poured into the same style of companies by a lot of different venture firms. You know, um, I think you saw this with, with storage for a while. We're now seeing this with food delivery, which sounds ridiculous. But if I were to ask, I don't know, 100 of you in the room, what is a challenge, what is a problem that you face every single day? Answering the question, what's for dinner, is always going to be one of them. So I think there'll be consolidation. But again, I don't know if that's the telltale sign in the bubble. I will say, just if anyone wants to try it out, the preferred food delivery service of the GeekWire team is, a, is one called Munchery. Uh, our our, con, our in-house connoisseur, Taylor Soper, one of our reporters, has tried them out extensively and recommends them highly. So Munchery <laughs> is, the, is the name of that. Um, so, so no tech bubble, but, but are we diverse enough as a region? You know, we've, we have moved on from the days when Microsoft was really the anchor of this community. It still is very important, but it's not the only player in town. Is this uh, tech, technology economy diverse enough at this point, and are there ways where it could get better, and, and maybe even ways that people in this room could, could help point, point us in that direction? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're not diverse enough. I'm sure there are people in the room who could point us in the right direction, but I wasn't saying no to that. But yes, we're, we are not diverse enough. We are a software town. We have a very strong software industry in this town. And we have probably the core of that software industry is the enterprise software business, which is really a legacy from Microsoft and the multi-generations of entrepreneurs that have been through that cycle. So if you look at the at the enterprise level, infrastructure level software, we do really well. I believe we have more people in that profession here than they do in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley's got a much broader ecosystem. They're doing a lot of different kinds of things. We have other things too. You know, we have games and we have other stuff, but, but that is the, the, our strength. And it's, uh, uh, Sarah mentioned earlier how um, the Bay Area has a, has a 25 year, year start on us, and, and that's true, and we have we have done very well in a, in a niche, but we have not yet blossomed out of that niche. So I, I, when you think about our industry, you have to remember it is pretty narrow yeah. compared to the Valley. Uh, I, I agree we need more diversity, but, but I take solace in the increased diversity that I'm seeing, particularly with a lot of the anchor tenants and the subset of anchor tenants that you see, these large companies that are growing that are doing very well. Beyond the Microsoft set, you now see this whole new cloud computing, cloud storage set that goes beyond Microsoft and Amazon, where you've got you know, Aptio focused on um, uh, tracking your IT and, and Chef with uh, migrating and managing and Second Watch with, with uh, providing a service around how you actually uh, manage that over time and, and Tableau and how you visualize data. There's also this whole new, this whole new wellspring of e-commerce startups that are cropping out of 
uh, the talent coming from Amazon with uh, not only Zoo Lily, but Julep and Rover. And of course, you also have Starbucks and Expedia and Costco and Nordstrom also helping provide a lot of that talent there too. There, uh, there's also, of course, the real estate segment with, uh, with uh, Zillow and Redfin and, and Market Leader, although now that's part of Zillow. So you do see these small uh, segments taking off here, and that draws talent to the region. People join those companies. They work for a couple years. They fall in love with the city. They start their own companies, and that creates new sectors. So I'm, I'm taking some, some solace in, in the growth that I'm seeing and in, in the diversity here. But everything you mentioned is software. It is software. Well, retail. Right. Well, that, yeah, the, uh, your, your 80, the 80 20 rule is 100% true, Jeremy, but there's 12,000 tech companies in the state of Washington. There were 430 new formed just last year. We are not exactly short on, on, that's just the startups in the tech sector. That does not include, to your point, retail, biomed, medical devices, food trucks. I mean, we are an entrepreneurial universe here. And so in terms of tech diversity, I think you're spot on, Jeremy. But in terms of diversity of startups, no. I think we have a really good, really solid uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem here. I'll be short. Um, we're not diverse uh, as I want to be, but I have never been more hopeful about what we can accomplish. I've never seen better signs that we are getting more and more diverse. So I'm, I'm really I'm excited to be in the community. I can't believe what progress we've made in the last five years alone and what's going to happen in the next five, right? It's amazing. All right, uh, one of the rules of uh, the online world is that your audience is smarter than you. So I want to open it up to questions. Uh, having spoken here at uh, Seattle 4 in the past, I know you guys have great questions. And while we're getting to the first question, I do also just want to say cloud computing, which Julie brought up, is very a very fascinating trend to, to be following. Um, you've had HP open its new global cloud computing center here in downtown Seattle. Oracle just opened a new cloud computing center here. It's going to be really a fascinating area to watch over the next five, six, seven years. So where's our first, first question? First question over here. I'm so glad I have an in with the microphone person. Uh, I'm really thrilled to see two out of five okay. of the panel members being women. I convinced my niece to switch her daughter to a K-5 uh, STEM school in West Seattle uh, for two years because I think that's where the future is for jobs. Unfortunately, now she's in middle school and there isn't a STEM school in West Seattle. What's the future for girls and women in the tech field? It's obviously something I'm very passionate about. I think everyone on this panel is passionate about. I spend a lot of personal time trying to do mentorship uh, all across the pipeline, right? There isn't a simple solution to this. Uh, if there was, we would have figured it out because there's definitely a will. Um, and I, we approach it at Moz both from, hey, how can we support women who are retraining to get into computer science with programs like Ada Academy that is um, giving an accelerated six-month program to teach women computer science and then give them a paid six-month internship. In addition to that, you know, I speak at every college, middle school girl, high school girl, STEM thing I can just to try to be that role model and put a face to it. Um, and we talk a lot about diversity at Moz as well. I mean, you can always do more. Um, but I, I think it's getting, I, think, I do think it's getting better. I wish I could say I think it'll be better in the next 10 years. I don't, because it is, it is a pipeline problem and those things don't change overnight. And it's not just women in tech. There's a lot of diversity issues in tech, right? It's, it's, it's embarrassing how white we are, right? It's embarrassing. We need to fix it. So it's, it's a complicated issue. Recently this year, the Washington State Legislature uh, passed a measure that allowed computer science as an elective to count as a core math or science class. I think the, the key thing is to get technology courses, computer science courses, to get kids started with that early. Uh, I, to me, it's not enough for to count. Computer science, in my opinion, starting very early should be a mandatory class alongside earth science and physics and chemistry because it is so relevant and so at the core of every single sector, every field that you can think of. And if it becomes a norm, if it, because, if it becomes something that both boys and girls at young ages are expected to know and take an interest in, uh, I think it's gonna, you're gonna address some of the cultural um, obstacles that I think a lot of girls face to pursue fields that are still considered kind of geeky. 
It should be norm. It should be a norm. It should be considered fun. I think code.org, uh, started by a local guy, Hadi Partovi, has done a great job with its marketing campaigns and demonstrating how computer science is cool, how it's fun, how it's so useful, how it's something that can make you a very, very valuable resource uh, in any community. And I think initiatives like that are just the start, but we need more. We need it early. Yeah, no, this is a big deal because we don't have the pipeline. We don't have the diversity today. We don't in gender or race or anything like that. And as a result, we don't have a lot of uh, female entrepreneurs and, and nearly as no, enough female executives in these companies as we need to have. And that really has to change over time. So I'm, it, it's going to take a long time, but I think, uh, I think there are a number of things in play that are at least getting us starting down the right, right path. Hey, we have a question. Can I ask, actually? Yeah. Nice. So um, I would ask everyone, because you are all mentors to somebody right now, whether you know it or not, right? And so when you see someone at, thinking, what should I do and should I go work for so-and-so, just ask them, have you ever started, thought about starting your own company? Just plant that seed. They may be not ready today or have the skill set today, but we've got to get them thinking that it's even a possibility. If we don't start the thinking that that's something that they could conceivably do, they aren't going to get there. And it's people like us in this room who help change mindsets every day, right? The, so that's one ask. Ask them, have you ever thought about starting your own company? The second ask I have is when you're talking about computer science and trying to inspire young people to do it, don't forget to talk about it as the most impactful way to change the world today, right? That software is eating the world and if you want to help people on a large scale this is what you do I think a lot of women fall off the bandwagon because they want to help people and make a difference and collaborate and all that happens in software every day it happens in computer science every day but we don't talk about it in those terms right we focus on well there's a lot of really hard math right it's just, surprisingly <laughs> not surpri not really motivating and inspiring right so that's my ask of you guys today because together we've got to change this culture and it's little conversations at a time and I just have to say, Julie, thank you so much for mentioning code.org. Hadi actually spoke to us in May. So yeah, he's been here. <laughs> Love it. Um, this is a question from Heather Fitzpatrick. Hi, this is actually a great follow-up. It's from uh, Sarah, what you were just talking about, about think about starting a company. Innovation is obviously a really core part of, of starting a company. You have to think of something that's new or different that will appeal to the market. Um, I read just recently that the new economy index has placed Washington at number four in innovation nationally. I'd be curious to hear all, all panelists' perspective on what barriers there are to increasing innovation in Washington State. What will it take to get us to number one? And on the flip side, when innovation happens, how does uh, VC preferences and funding, funding certain types of um, startups in, in certain areas, affect what kind of innovation happens in our state? In my opinion, the, I'll answer your first question uh, to start. Uh, the, the single greatest obstacle to innovation in our state is access to talent. Uh, we talked a little bit before about uh, computer science education. I think there's two, two ways to think about the talent needed to continue the innovation cycle here. One is, is homegrown talent, which I think is its own panel. I think the second is imported talent, which, uh, which in my opinion, though it might be controversial, uh, is, is just as important, if not more important. Even if we had you know, every single student in King County taking computer science courses and a meaningful percentage majoring in computer science, it's not going to keep up with, with the pace of demand uh, for the skill set um, in, in this state. So we need to be able to import talent. Uh, I like what I see uh, in Massachusetts from, from state to state. I think non-competes play a role in how fluidly people can move from company to company. Their reform there has been helpful. Uh, I'd like to see more uh, sort of a higher threshold for H-1 visas uh, being issued for highly skilled workers, uh, workers or even students wanting to achieve advanced degrees. It really puts a cap on the talent that can come into the state and anybody who's been a hiring manager in a tech company can speak to the importance of, of importing talent as well. I'll answer a bit of the second question, which is uh, preferences for investors and how that affects the kind of innovation that occurs. Uh, I think that definitely happens. I think investors are more likely to invest in things they understand. They can, they can predict outcomes better. So I do believe that is uh, an issue. Um, fortunately, you know, investors are fairly mobile. Uh, it's not only Seattle venture capitalists and, and angels who fund companies here. There is quite a bit of, of capital that comes from outside as well, so that, that helps quite a bit. Next question here. 
Amgen, Amgen's shut down. How serious an impact on the local biotech community and any significant impact on the broader tech community? Yeah, Michael, do you want to tackle that one from the yeah, sure. WTA perspective? Um, it's, it's disappointing, um, but when you look at the rationale given for it, it's also understandable. Um, as, I, as I pointed out on the question earlier about whether or not we're in a tech bubble, um, there's been a bull run. There's been a significant bull run in the biotech sector here in uh, specifically the Seattle, city of Seattle. During the entire recession, our biotech sector was growing at 12% compounded annual growth rate while the rest of the sector was going down. So there's, there's going to be, you know, movements in a plus and a minus direction. But overall, I think it's not really a bad sign. It's just, it's a correction. For those of you who don't know, Amgen was the company that bought Immunex, which is the company behind Enbrel, which is the drug that Phil Mickelson markets on your Saturday afternoon golf. <laughs> we have a question here from Corrine Kavanaugh. Hi, thanks for being here today. We really appreciate it. I had a question on neutrality, which is a hot topic it's happening right now, and um, even this morning, Tom from Tom Wheeler from the FCC made a statement that they're leaning towards regulation, and the public has really gone crazy commenting on what their opinion is for net neutrality. Um, in fact, it was the second most commented on thing from the F to the FTC besides um, Janet Jackson's little whoopsie. So. Um, what I, what I wanted to ask the panel, and maybe you, Michael, could address this. First of all, you know, what would regulation do to people's individual experience with the internet, and how would it affect organizations? And then how can we make our opinion known? You go to the FCC website, there's an email address there. Um, and there's also, if, you're not, if you want to find out exactly what the email address is, or the URL, you can go to my association's website, washingtontechnology.org. I've already blogged on this topic. Click on the link, send the FCC a comment. Everybody in the room, send a comment. Okay, what are you gonna talk about? Here's basic, I'm gonna dumb this really down because this is a highly technical legal issue. Basically, the issue is the following. The proposal at the topic at the uh, FCC is that they would like to allow the internet service providers, which includes companies like Verizon, Comcast, etc., to create a fast lane on the internet that they can then charge more money to, example, to Amazon for privileged access to a faster internet. So in a sense, in essence, what it's going to do is going to change the rules of the game, that if a company has a lot more money, they can buy faster access to their marketplace, which is now everybody with a browser on a web phone, right? So if you create a new world in which you can buy faster access, that means that there are going to be people who don't have fast access. And who would that be? Anybody with less money, which would be startups. So frankly, this entire issue is core to the Seattle area. If you want to have an internet in which it's possible for a startup in a garage with two people and no money to have equal access to the marketplace. And yeah, it's harder to get your, your application known because there are so many. But if you want equal access to that marketplace, then you need what's called net neutrality. That means everyone's created equal in terms of access to the pipe. That's a bit in a nutshell. So if you think that's a great idea, uh, please don't send a comment. <laughs> if you think it's a terrible idea, then send Tom Wheeler a comment that says you think it's a terrible idea. They just need to hear from enough people. I think we have one, one last question. One more question here. My question has to do with uh, Amazon. You may have seen the uh, several, uh, there's more than 100 authors in the New York Times basically accusing Amazon of being a bully. Is Amazon the elephant in the room or the bully in the room? My husband is writing a novel right now. <laughs> and I love Amazon and I consume tons of books on my Kindle and I feel really close to authors, but my husband comes from the world where if it's not a major publishing house, you haven't made it and they're here there to provide you real services. So we, you can imagine the wonderful dinner conversations <laughs> we have about this. I mean, so from my perspective, they're not a bully. They're trying to change a marketplace. I, I once had the great privilege of um, having tea with Margaret Atwood 
crazy, right? Margaret Atwood I'm having tea with. And I couldn't believe when Margaret Atwood told me that her publisher had not scheduled anything in her publishing tour, that her, that her publisher had not built her website, that her publisher had not got her book um, cover art done, right? And so I was just left there going, if Margaret Atwood doesn't have the negotiating power to drive real marketing, like what are the publishers doing? We don't need them to curate anymore. We have, we have more direct means to curate. The internet is a wonderful way to curate content. So I'm, I don't think Amazon is a bully. I think we're in the middle of a very, 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 very painful, tragic change for a lot of people. It's, when industries die, it's tragic. You have to grieve, and we're grieving. Um, but I think there's a lot of miscommunication. And if my husband were here, he'd argue the completely different thing with total same conviction. Yeah, let's hear it, Julie. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, I I don't necessarily think that uh, Amazon is an elephant in the room because everybody's talking about it. Um, but at the same time, um, Amazon is very focused on providing the best service possible to its customers. Uh, that is just as much true internal to the company as it is in the PR around the company. And with that comes a focus on the best availability. Uh, the best selection, the most convenience, and uh, the best price. And, uh, and with that, the intrinsic value of a piece of digital content is subject to debate by a lot of different people. Those who create the content, those who distribute the content, those who are the agents who sell the content. Uh, and I, I don't think it's a crystal clear issue uh, exactly, or I don't think there's a crystal clear answer right now on what the actual value of an ebook is. That said, uh, you know, as, a, as a customer, I, I'm very much for uh, Amazon's values uh, around providing the best service to customers, and I'm very much for lower ebook prices, provided that authors are compensated fairly. Uh, I do think that it will be an industry that will continue to see disintermediated, especially by the likes of uh, Kindle's self publishing platform uh, and others that its competitors are, are, are launching. Yeah. All right, well, I don't want to be the one responsible for pushing you past 1.30, so at this point I'd like to say a very big thank you to Jeremy Jake, Julie Sandler, Michael Schutzler, and Sarah Bird. Thank you. Thank you to Todd and the panelists, and for those of you who want more information, Todd has a weekly program on what channel? Cairo Radio. Radio at noon on Saturdays. It's fascinating. KUOW, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. And uh, just so you know, too, that a, a thousand pounds of food has been donated in your all name to Rotary First Harvest. Thank you so much for being here today. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.